Good day. This is the Eye of the Storm podcast with the big picture technical update for the S&P 500 being recorded on Saturday, April the 13th, 2024. As I sit down and present my charts, I have also noticed that Iran has launched uh, drone strikes against Israel. And there's a lot of posturing going on, but it is a geopolitical situation that we have been keeping an eye on that is now in action uh, as to what the, the reactions are going to be or what, if anything, we don't even know any response other than Israel said it will respond. Uh, the United States is preparing and different airspaces have been closed, etc. So this is in motion. And so in the initial reaction coming off is what I'm reading is that Bitcoin and other cryptos are as I think one time said, collapsing or going down strongly or something of that nature. But I believe that when I checked, Bitcoin closed Friday at uh, 67,445 and somewhere it's trading somewhere around 62,000. So yes, taking a little bit of a hit there. So having what the response would be, I will discuss, but first, how I want to approach today is by going over both the cash and the futures market as they were left on Friday on a technical basis. So currently, I'm going to start here with the cash. I'm on a four-hour chart. I continue to view that we are in the process of finishing a, in, an intermediate C wave to finish a primary B wave. Now, we've been wrestling with the potential that it may already be complete, and that would have happened where I'm marking as wave three. There is the potential that that is where wave five would come in and three would get moved here, and then this would be four and a five, and the five would go here in the C, et cetera, all the way up to primary B, which would put us into the beginning phases or the beginning stages of the primary C wave down. So taking into consideration what is now going on, again, in the Middle East, and how that escalation will be viewed or how it will actually even be dealt with and what actually will take place, it's in motion. So the speculation is that markets aren't really going to like it. So now let's take a look technically how they were left on Friday and what should that not have happened and it was still out there swirling around as a possibility. Well, then the market may react in a particular way. So let's kind of look at that. So within it, again, I believe that we're still topping within the primary B wave. And it, to my view right now, I am interpreting it, we're closed on Friday as the possibility that that on the four hour chart shows where the minute fourth wave of minor wave five completed. Now, again, here in the S&P, unlike the NASDAQ, it is not a diagonal triangle it's a straight five up in the third wave being the longest not the best formed not the easiest to read uh, but still because of the depth that we're coming down if the bulls are going to hang on to anything if this thing is going to turn it here is the no fly zone but if we fly over 5038 basically that's the exact level so 5,040, easier to remember, if it breaks strongly below, it is going to turn our picture back over to where that high on the 28th of March completed minute wave five, minor wave five, intermediate wave C, and primary wave B. And now we're dropping in the initial stages of the primary C wave which would be forming the first five down. Now, if that's the case, folks, then let me just finish if that will go over the negative, if the case is this is all done, what it looks like. But let's just say that we are going to finish this fourth wave. If we take a look at that, and we're going to come down one more to the hourly chart so we can see inside, uh, what you'll notice is there is the third. These are the fibs. Uh, larger fibs for upside. These are fibs for upside. And again, I'm going on the fact that Friday's low likely completed uh, 
and this would be A, B, C, X, A, B, C. So it's a double A, B, C down, four of four. And if that's the case, and there, there is a possibility maybe we get a little bit of additional downside, but then again, the no-fly zone is down here, 5,038, and I'm calling it 5,040 as well. And a little bit of spill, yes, but not anything where it just goes through as if it didn't exist. That will be the key. If it goes through it, like, who cares? then the market is letting you know it's a one, two, one, two. But now we're looking that it could have a little bit of a spill below where we are. And there is additional support, I believe, at 550, obviously. But I think somewhere up in like 575, 580 area, there might be a little bit more. So if it just comes down a little bit more, then that fourth wave would go there. But it needs to then turn and, and, and rally. That's the important part. That's the main component. It's going to be directional, of course, but it's going to be how deep and how fast it goes. Now, if it goes slightly and holds and they start to rally, they should rally hard. In other words, they just we're going in and we're this is the deal. And they come in and they start moving the market in that direction. And so we'll, we'll, we will notice where they're going after. And it could be, again, a reaction is coming out of Friday's expiration. It could be just pure algorithmically controlled in terms of derivatives. So again, if you're a dealer and somebody's coming in and they're buying puts, you're selling them the puts, you're selling the stock, you're selling the whatever the index is. You'd be selling that if because you're selling puts. So that's what dealers, if you were on the other side of that, you're going to buy. You're going to buy the underlying if you're buying a put. Those are the hedges. So it, but the, if, the, the thought process is you're buying puts because the market's going to go down. So we're just telling you, it's like what happens is that can become a true, it's going to be a flip from the market being bought and calls are being bought. And then the dealers are selling the stock. In this case, if, if they're truly having to sell puts, the hedges is, is having to sell the future as well, having to sell the underlying as well. So it, it creates the opposite effects. In other words, it, it's like sellers of the calls on the way up need to hedge by buying the stock. Sellers of puts on the way down, and if everybody's buying and then you're you're the, the dealer, you have to sell the put, you're going to need to sell the stock or the underlying. That's your hedge against what you're doing. <clears throat> so... Considering all of that being pushed into motion, depending on what retail or you know they're wanting to do, um, will depend on what the market, of course, is going to do. So we have the both sides. If it just kind of comes in, and and they're holding it, then again, we're looking for them to possibly just start to move the market higher, and we will. Be looking for these levels. So the way that this, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Again, if it all holds, we would count it as an ABC X ABC, allowing just a little bit more for this particular C wave. If this is one two three one, nah, that that can't really count. So even if it's one two and this is a third, it can come down. But then if it starts to break, then then we know what that count is going to be. I'm not going to do it again. If it doesn't and we hold and we start to rally, here are the points. I would move these, but let's just say we rally from the opening on Monday. Then I'm looking at that being the low and our first level is 5181. And then we have 5219 and 5226, different fibs, but still the resistance is 5226. Outside of that, this would take us again to new highs over three so that it's it's now a candidate to complete. If indeed we're going to rally and it's going to end up being a minute fifth wave, there's the zone. And I would imagine that it's got to happen as fast as what it what they did the other day. And it seemed in the moment that we were getting pretty far, but in reality, it truly, you know, it was just the day. 
you know, reaching 5137 on the opening and then getting up to fi above 5200 was quite the feat for the S&P. So again, we'll see what they want to do tomorrow in terms of that. Now, downside again, one, two, one, two, one, two. And it already looks like we're in the third. So if there could be, this is the other gig. The other side of the coin is that if it's one, this is the cash. One, two, one, two, one, two. We're in the third. So three, four, five, four, five, four, five. And so then that 50, 40 would likely break. And we go and we start to go. Then we're running the fibs from that high, right? We'd be looking at that being all done, going back out to the four-hour chart. Then this is done. And now we're, we're reversing everything and we're starting to look for downside. Where were the downside support come in? And initially, you know, you're really looking at a quick run back to 5,000 because of how it all rallied. Now, going over to the ES, let's take a look at the futures market. It's a little bit different, a little bit different, not by much. So again, same deal. We're in the C wave, primary B, intermediate wave C, minor wave five, minute, uh, minor wave four, the way that that's counted. So just to catch up the picture, same deal. What do we got? A, B, C, X, A, B, C. We put in a four. Now, this actually did come down, put in nice, and, again, similar, to, you know, so did the cash. But even after hours, we came down a little bit further. So what we have in place, again, is one, two, three. This would be four. And we run back and go higher. Now, what type of picture can we put in there? We're going to be looking at, this is saying that this four holds, again, both cash and futures market. That's a big if at the moment. So... We will see what actually takes place. But technically, if that holds and they come in and they start buying it tomorrow, well, then we'd be looking for it to start to rally pretty strongly. If it wants to continue to go down, how do we want to look at this? Same deal. One, two, one, two, one, two. One, two, one, two, one, two. And we're dropping in a third. So I would not expect anything other than a big gap and fall. Now, if this thing gaps and it gaps below 51, 22, 23. So if it falls below, it should do it. If it gaps below, look out because that's the no fly zone, right? Pulling this back out again. You know, and then we have 5,000, which is way four. The low of way four, pretty much right there at 5,000. I think we're right below it. But again, you know, if we start to gap through this, I'm looking for it to break 5,100. This is the futures market. If it breaks 5,100, well, you got a little bit of support down here at 5,025-ish. You probably could get a little bit of support like at 93-ish. They'll figure it out and they'll put it up there. And we could run fibs all the way around this thing and fill all this in and, and you know, where, where different things can jump and go and et cetera. But what I'm looking at on a technical basis, how it was left on Friday, the anticipation would be you'll offer a little bit more downside. But again, there's your marker. Your marker is 51. I'm going to go right over here to that company. Your marker is 5122.75. It was 51.23. If it starts to break with force but below 5120, you're starting to think, uh-uh, it's breaking wave one. It's over that high on the 28th, 27th of March. Actually, come on, just put it on there. The 31st of March was the completion point, and that completed it all. Wave three would be moved down. Wave five would be right there along with the minor five, the intermediate C, and the primary B. And we're off to the races. And if that's the case, one, two, one, two, one, two, get out of the way. And I mean that. So, yeah, this is like, this is, it's hard to try to imagine, but I just think we need to bear and keep in mind 
the potential that it could just be a four and they come in ignoring. If the response is like no damage was done, nobody was killed, et cetera, eh, okay, let them fight it out. And they just come in and they start buying again. Because don't forget that we, we're moving into earnings. We got earnings coming in and it starts in earnest on Monday. And then we also have the Friday, the April expiration, which, by the way, I don't feel strongly that it's going to be working it toward the buy side. I think that that the expiration will be similar to what we just saw. I could be could be wrong on that, but you know it's going to be depend where you're going to see option uh, option volume. You know if it's going to come to the calls, or it's going to be in the puts. And when we start to see one decay, et cetera, et cetera, or premium, more volatility. So don't forget the volatility spiked on Friday, basically, as to how it's been trading. Volatility is up two on Friday. And that's been a lot, considering that it's been down, 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 down. They sell it, they sell it. The previous day, they sold volatility to take the money and to go put it into what they did. And then on Friday, had to reverse it. Now, that all might have been as part of an expiration. I don't know. But I just know that that's what the flows did. And so it was a little bit easier to realize that the, the flows aren't changing. And you can see when they did. And where they were changing was in Apple. Apple continued to just hold itself higher. And then suddenly they somebody needed a big chunk of stock. And boom, they ran in. And boom, 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 boom. There goes the NASDAQ. Boom, boom, boom. There goes the, the S&P. And it's like when it was over, it was a vacuum. And they go, oh, there's no more buyers. Well, you got to hit that bid. Bam. And they did. So the, the moves were mm, sometimes a little tiring, but for the most part, uh, pretty strong in terms of being able to make money and be consistent on both sides. That would be as a day trader, both sides of that kind of worked out. And by the way, I my intent in the trade room is I need to be adding the S&P. I think the S&P is also an excellent market to trade. My focus, of course, has been the NASDAQ. Uh, but I found that the that the S and P, yes, it is controlled by the same Mag Seven that the Nasdaq is, but it's more more pronounced uh, when individually within Mag Seven or outside of Mag Seven. You know, you're, you're, you're looking at some of the other bigger bigger stocks when they come into play. The Nasdaq itself gets much more jumpy and crazy. And like you know, somebody walks in and they got a lot of Apple to buy or they've got a lot of NVIDIA to sell and it just kind of goes, you'll see, the, you'll see the index react immediately and then suddenly just jump back. And that can wreak havoc on your whatever you're trading. Now, having said that, back here in the S&P, we got to take into consideration that it would be one, two, one, two, one, two, and this is the start of a third, and it's just going to come fly and it would break. That should be very gappable, so to speak, come tomorrow. And again, a lot's going to depend on if if cryptos continue to head south, I would imagine that gold's going to turn around and you know and go right back and go right back above 2,400 and back on up probably towards 2,500 because that's really where the resistance now is going to be since it's already been above 24. Okay, so, but let's stick to the s and I'm sorry. So in any case, you can see here, RSI, <clears throat> the one hour RSI, you can see is pretty oversold and beginning to turn back up to get itself out of that. That supports this. Markets can stay oversold on that level. If I go out, even if I take a look, let's go out to the weekly and take a look. You can see, ah, uh, topping. So hourlies can stay overbought or oversold while the others catch up. Look at the daily. Eh, the daily's a little bit, but it can get a lot harder, a lot more before the market would turn. So either way, we'd be looking for some additional should those break giving all the break levels, the do, the do not fly zone, so to speak. So we'll be looking for that. And as far as economic data for next week, I think that, let me just take a peek. We're nothing on Monday, which is probably not a bad thing. And I'll oh, actually take that back. 
Oh, that was this week. Yeah. Starting on the 15th, we have the Empire State Manufacturing. We have U.S. Retail Sales, Business Inventories, Home Builder Confidence, plus Fed People Out Speaking. Tuesday, Housing Starts, Building Permits, and Industrial Production and Capacity Utilization. Fed Chair Jerome Powell will be out speaking along with Vice Chair Philip Jefferson. And Wednesday's Fed Beige Book, a couple of Fed people out speaking, but I'm telling you, every day they're out. You know what they're doing. And then on Thursday, initial jobless claims, Philly Fed manufacturing, and then one, two, existing home sales, U.S. leading economic indicators comes out on Thursday. Wrap that around, we have uh, the Atlanta Fed guy out talking twice, uh, the New York Fed president and the Fed governor all out on Thursday and Friday, just one. There's no uh, data due out on Friday. So eh, a fair week for things that can happen, uh, plus plus, right? So that's the picture for the S&P. I hope everybody has a really great balance to the weekend and uh, good trading on Monday and next week.